Feeling better, there's no doubt about it. And my days are brighter, my shoulders are so much lighter. Just for a moment there, I thought that there was nothing more to life. I thought about it, wrote a couple songs. David, it's so great to be here. So good to talk to a human being. It is nice. In this day and age, man, things are a little bit on the um, isolated side, and I don't really like that. Yeah, I mean, we got through, we thought we were through COVID, and then now we, then we had Delta, and now we have Omicron. And mm. so now, you know, we're back to, back to virtual, virtual meetings. But it's good to see you. Thanks for uh, having me on. Very good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and give you a nice, warm introduction. Is that all right? I'm going to dive into this. And um, Of course. All right. Well, I want to welcome everyone to uh, Nonprofit Online Podcast. I'm David Higgins. I'm your host. Um, I love technology. I remember when I built my first computer. It was a Windows 460, and this is way back in the DOS era. And I just, like the car I owned, I could work on it, and I could fix it, and I understood. The policies were in place for the Internet weren't really in there. Um, I could work in my car, too. I mean, I could change the brakes and the clutch. But today, even though I can build a computer today, I everything has gotten much more complicated. I don't dare touch my car. It always goes into the mechanic if it needs work. And uh, the tech world has gotten just as complicated or even more so than my car. So as nonprofits are pushing into the digital age, they run about 10 years behind the marketplace. And in the last two years, we've needed to have a quick catch up. Because we can't do our, our, our traditional fundraising. The, the way we were fundraising for many years does not work in this current climate, in this culture. And we're finding that nonprofits that are shifting into it are having double-digit growth versus struggling even to make budget. And so that's what we want to encourage you in, in this conversation today. What businesses are doing in 2010 to 2018 to draw revenue and sales is now mandatory for nonprofits to understand. According to the National Philanthropic Foundation study and quoted by NPR News, 38% of nonprofits are in jeopardy of closing their doors. For the most part, the ones in trouble are the charities caring for the most vulnerable parts of our society. And I don't know about you, but uh, Joe, those are the ones we can't afford to lose. Those are the ones yeah. that are really helping us maintain our humanity as a nation in, in many regards. Um, because, in my opinion, nonprofits are afraid. They're afraid of something new. We're afraid of what we don't know. We're pushing away from technology, uh, especially when we find out that there's policies involved. And we're like, I don't know. And, and we step back from that cutting edge because we are more comfortable with what works in the past, even though we proved to ourselves it's really not working right now. We're hoping for that magic fundraiser or donation that will get us through this particular problem that we're facing with our budget. You know, in the last two years, the nonprofits that have pushed into digital funnels and online fundraising, apps, digital websites with Google, or dynamic websites with Google ad grant support, social media have grown. And some of them have grown. I know a brand new nonprofit that decided to put all their fundraising online. They raised over seven figures their second year. It was shocking. And, and they're a small community fundraiser. Usually they would do fundraisers that would raise $10,000. Now online, that same one is raising $120,000. Um, it makes a big difference. But that's why today's conversation is important. That is why it's so important for us to understand what's going on in the life of our next guest. He has, he has launched and spearheaded the nonpartisan, nonprofit 501c3 committed to civil rights, empowerment, justice, and inclusion in technology public policy making. It is called the Washington Center for Technology Policy Inclusion, which is quite a mouthful. So we also, it's known by Washington, Washing Tech, W-A-S-H-I-N-G Tech, T-E-C-H. Founded in 2014, Washington Tech is a hub focused on inter the intersection between tech law and policy, social justice, and inclusion. Is also the host of Washington Podcast. And let's welcome nonprofit founder, attorney, and policy influencer Joe Miller to Nonprofit Online. Hey, Joe. Hey, everybody. Great. Hey, David, how are you? I, I'm, you know, I'm picturing the applause in my head, you know, when you when you in, uh, introduce someone in a live event, you yeah, there we go. There we yep. go. So it's good, it's good to be here. And you're right. I mean, really, 
you know, we've all got to be systems engineers now. And there's a lot of trial and error in all of these organizations. I mean, we started this in 2014 when I was laid off from one of the organizations that you're talking about, one of the more analog and sort of stodgier organizations that you know, that is very difficult to move uh, mm. because you don't have the digital expertise on hand. Uh, and so, you know, you could, from our perspective, as you know, we kind of have to learn as we go. We started our podcast in 2015. We've got 220, 75 episodes um, so far. Uh, and we're just getting into video. So as you can see here, like I got to figure out what to do about all these shadows. You know, you figured out, you see your, your shadows are, are taken care of. So, you know, the, it's the little things that uh, that can be a challenge. And if you don't have... Mm -hmm. Uh, enough folks on staff, and you don't have the resources. Um, it can it can be it can be easy to, to despair and 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 lose focus. You know, when I was uh, talking to my team at the very beginning of this journey here in 2020, uh, we're looking at this podcast, and uh, we found YouTube one of the great educators of people talking about what they're doing successfully, and found very inexpensive ways. I know nonprofits are trying to do what you and I already do. They're trying to find a way to get their knowledge base out um, of the, just the doors. Um, and um, I could recommend to anyone watching, uh, look at YouTube, look at what's working. You'll find people on very low budgets starting some really wonderful things. Like the lighting setup for me cost only 300 bucks. And it was um, and just placement and where that works. And of course, um, the first 14, 15 episodes we never showed because we're continuing to tweak it. Go, oh, that didn't work. This didn't work. Um, but, uh, you know, you're a busy man. You're doing something where there's a real vacuum. And what are, what are you up to these days? So, I mean, it's, a, it's, you know, you're right. We're dealing with a lot of issues. We're dealing with issues that are traditionally, uh, you know, locked into D.C. We're only lobbyists and, you know, folks who work for the government and, you know, folks who work for, you know, huge nonprofits within D.C. have had access to lawmakers to kind of persuade them on you know how they should be shaping tech policy, and by tech policy, I'm referring to things like you know misinformation, how to deal with misinformation online, how to deal with privacy, children's mm -hmm. privacy, you know how to deal with antitrust law, and how uh, competition policy affects uh, consumers. So our platform is designed to bring voices from across the country, really across the world, into that debate and ex and uh, give our lawmakers exposure. Uh, to, to some to voices outside the uh, the echo chamber. So we just did a, a live webinar on uh, children's online privacy, which we we did live, and we're going to release as an evergreen uh, product very soon. Uh, we're still uh, uh, producing our podcast. Uh, you know, like you, we're you know constantly under pressure to develop content, uh, and so I spend a lot of my time just you know managing those workflows. You know, I said before that we've got to be systems engineers, we've got to be yeah. project managers, we've got to learn as nonprofits, we've always had to learn how to do, uh, to wear a lot of hats. Mm -hmm. And so that's where automation comes into play. And, you know, it's, it's definitely been a journey. And I think a lot of folks now who are quitting their jobs and going out on their own, you know, thank, thanks to, to platforms like yours and mine, and we can teach them and help them ramp up a lot more quickly uh, than we did when we were starting out and we had to figure it out for ourselves. Yeah. I, you used the term, you used the term evergreen product, which I know what that is, but a lot of our nonprofit leaders and volunteers that listen to this podcast probably have not heard that term before. Can you give us a quick definition of what that is? Sure. So, I mean, we have one-off events and then we have recorded events that people can pretty much access forever. Mm -hmm. uh, live events, for example, which with the Washington Post or the New York Times where they bring guests in and they speak. Uh, I'm not sure if they provide access after the event, mm -hmm. but that access after the event is what uh, constitutes evergreen content. So evergreen means that it's content that's always going to be meaningful, no matter how much times change. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the idea is to make that content as evergreen as possible. Obviously, with law and policy, we're going to be changing uh, the content a lot. There are a lot of developments that happen in the interim between you know, after you after you do your your last version until you you know you need to revise it. But the idea is to keep that uh, content up as long as possible, so mm -hmm. folks can access it uh, forever and drive subscribers uh, and revenues. If you're selling your webinar uh, to the nonprofit as a revenue stream, you know, a great uh, nonprofit idea that I'm just going to throw in here in the middle of this conversation because 
uh, might be a great fundraising idea for a nonprofit that's listening right now. Um, we have a one that I worked with just here at the end of this last year. It was a homeless outreach, and they did their, a lot of their uh, focus was on food pantries, and they ran seven food pantries in very impoverished areas in the center of their state. And uh, they're like, David, what can we do? Because they've done nothing but grant work and physical tactile fundraising. And uh, they are short in their budget. And so we did a 90-minute evergreen webinar on how to prepare your, um, how to prepare for emergency food um, and how to be ready in case you had a closed in winter or something to that effect. And they put together some amazing stuff from their 30 years of experience put it together in a 90-minute tutorial, um, brought in a couple of their experts, and we uh, got a volunteer video company to come in, videotaped, edited that entire 90-minute uh, webinar for free, got it edited for free, and then was able to put it in an evergreen webinar setting. And then people throughout the city and actually across county and state lines could go on there. And during that free webinar, they were given multiple opportunities just to donate what they felt the value of that webinar was to them. And as a result, that nonprofit raised over $16,000 just from that Evergreen webinar, and it ran for three weeks. Um, I think it's still running because it's an Evergreen, right? But uh, I, am, I love that. Well, I yeah, want I mean, to talk a little bit more about you. I so, mean, that's the key. That's the, that's the key, right? Um, uh, you know, as a nonprofit, you know, you get to apply the same principles uh, that folks in a, in a commercial business would apply. Uh, but, you know, the benefit is that as a nonprofit, you have folks out there who are passionate about your mission and want to volunteer yeah. and help you do things like edit your or even write or create the storyboard for your webinar. So that's really kind of a, a position of strength that we have as nonprofits. So you are a young man that grew up in New York. Well, you're not no longer the young man, but you grew up in New York yeah. City and uh, your journey brought you from New York to pursue law, launch a tech policy influencing nonprofit. That's quite a journey. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I started my career in radio. There's a station in New York called Hot 97, which is a hip hop and R&B radio station. I started working there as a part time job when I was, um, you know, a teenager, you know, and stuff like that and you know working in the studio and working with people who were on air and back then radio really had a strong tie with the uh with the community uh we moved uh, to dc uh, after i was out of law school in 20, 2005 my wife and i uh, my then fiance now, now wife and i um and i had to figure out how to bring that broadcast experience and the legal experience into play in an environment like washington and so that's kind of been the uh, journey of the last seven years is kind of, you know, learn building from the building that foundation from the ground up, building trust and um, engagement with the audience, and really creating uh, pro uh, products that are uh, meaningful uh, to them. I mean, I you know, I had to figure it out for myself. I wasn't at 31 when we moved here. I wasn't really too keen on working for the Hill because the money wasn't so great. Um, you know, people coming out of law school and you like. Like most people, you know, we have student loans and things like that. So, you know, working on the Hill wasn't really an option. Working at the FCC wasn't really an option. Uh, you know, the prof legal profession is also very status conscious. So, mm -hmm. you know, they go very much by, you know, what kinds of what the names of the schools are on your resume. So the beauty of the of the um, Internet is that you can explode all of that because really a lot of those organizations are, you know, really struggling to remain uh, relevant. We've seen a lot of uh, law firms close. Uh, we see, you know, law schools under pressure, you know, from students, universities in general under a lot of pressure to actually deliver a value. Uh, a lot of folks are upset because they're, you know, back on their family's uh, couch after they spent tens of thousand dollars on, yeah. on, um, on, uh, you know, these schools that promise jobs, whether they're for profit or nonprofit, uh, and never delivered. Uh, and so, you know, again, the great thing about the internet and the great thing about the moment that we're in is that everyone can create a platform and that everyone uh, has the tools at their disposal, um, some more than others, and that's a problem we have to work on. Uh, mm -hmm. But we have the tools, the tools are available to uh, us uh, to evaluate what's going on in the marketplace and really address the questions that are on people's minds, as opposed to just standing in the ivory tower and, you know, basically throwing it to them like free bread or something. 
Yeah. Now, I'm going to have some fun here just for a second. I was doing some research before this conversation, and uh, you spent a lot of time in your high school years in the performing art world. Uh, do you have any hidden talents, musical talents, or anything that you want to reveal to the world today? Yeah, I mean, I went to LaGuardia High School of Music and Art. It was a great, fantastic four years. They say college is the best four years. I think, you know, high school is probably the best, and, you know, college was a, a close second. Um, but, you know, I don't know if you, you, you're probably familiar with Fame, the TV show. and Yeah. Broadway that, when I was a kid, I loved that show. Yeah, that's the school, but that that actual location really? burned down, and then they combined music and art and performing arts into LaGuardia, and then there's a competitive audition um, for that. Um, you know, and I know New York City is trying to make education like that more accessible um, and move away from this model of you know one school, you know, kind of being the arbiter of who's talented and who's not. But I got in on piano. I got it on the music uh, Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. Wow. You know, had some ear ear uh, tests, and sight singing tests. And, you know, I got in and it was a great uh, four years. I mean, the friends that I met there are still my friends now. It's nice. The legal profession, which isn't always as, as uh, creative of a, of a profession, mm -hmm. unless you're writing a lot, it's doing uh, argumentation in court, um, which is what, you know, the writing part is what I've sort of gravitated for in the content production uh, side of that. Uh, but a lot of it is sort of wrote you know, continues to be memorizing it and learning from practice. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I have friends from high school who, I, you know, I don't have to feel self-conscious about being a creative person around. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, that's been, uh, that's been uh, you know, a real benefit for me. I, and I cherish my experience there. Absolutely. No, and I, um, when I started in the music, I, my mom said that if we were a church-going family in my earlier years and she said, if I ever disappeared in the middle of a church service, she would find me at three years of age in the side hallway where there's a piano and I'd be banging yeah. on the lid of the piano. And yeah. uh, when I was, we did a lot of traveling. When I was nine, I was introduced to Mrs. Nepshield and she was a classical piano teacher and she was strict. I mean, she was a, one of those piano teachers with a ruler and um, she had a German background. I learned my Mozart. I learned my Chopin. It was, it was something. And I was her oldest student. She usually started all of her students at three to four. I started at nine. But when I was 13, um, the, there was a church we were going to had a large orchestra and their piano player moved and they asked me if I'd come in and play. And I was the only teenager on the stage and uh, I would sit there and the bass guitar player, I kid you not, he was from the Hells Angels. He was, had a big beer belly, had two tours in Vietnam um, and uh, he had come in and got involved with church and left that lifestyle behind, but he played the bass. And he'd stand right behind the piano and put the pegs of the bass arm about an inch from the back of my head. And every time I hit a mistake, he'd pop me in the back of the head with that bass guitar. I loved Mike. Wow. We ended up being really good friends, but he oh, thought good. it was funny. And I'd go home from music practice with a bunch of knots back here. But uh, I first yeah. time I got to travel and do music was um, I was 15. And uh, by then, Mike was no longer standing behind me with his bass guitar. But I got to music's taken me around the world several times. And uh, it was, it was, uh, it's a real adventure. Not a lot of people get to do that. And uh, I enjoyed it. I really did. It's great that you, that you stuck with it. Do you, do you still, you know, do you, do you find it yeah. difficult running the business and everything to still find time to, to jam out or? Uh... My piano is kind of like my meditation, especially mm -hmm. on days when my blood pressure is high or there's a lot of pressure to get answers. I'll go sit on the piano because that's about the only time like the sound life disappears. And I'll just play chords, progressions, yeah. you know, a little bit of classical, a little bit of R&B and just yeah. fall, fall my way back into trying to find my peace of mind. So probably three, four times a week I'm sitting on there. I start with my scales, like probably you and I did for many, many years. And then I just end up making noise. And uh, yeah. it's kind of my my thing now. And yeah. I'm, though I've, I've aged out of being on a stage many, many years ago. Um, it's Michelle calls my piano, which I've had since my teenage years. It's gone everywhere with me. It's a little, a world, sir, uh, calls it my mistress. So she goes, leave your mistress and come to bed. Yeah, that's what, that's what, uh, that's, you know, I have my childhood piano as well. We actually just got it. Um, but that's great that you can find time for that. I mean, that, you know, you never know where you're going to find teachers and that's great that you had that experience with that. And then I found that, uh, you know, music teachers are you know super volatile if, uh, 
you know, they feel like they're, they're wasting time or, you know, that you're not prepared for the class. I've had not all music teachers, but I've had some, uh, especially at LaGuardia that would get um, upset if uh, you didn't, and forget it if you didn't practice and forget about going in there and playing chopsticks. Like that wasn't allowed at all. Like no one was, <laughs> I guess if you play chopsticks or something, it's considered low brow or something. I don't know. But we were, I remember they're it, fun, it being though. very uh, sort of um, passe and, you know, frowned upon to, you know, sit in a room and play chopsticks. Yeah. Uh, My wife knows chopsticks. She'll uh, yeah. come and she'll want to play a duet with me. It ends up being chopsticks almost every time. So yeah. <laughs> one day you and I'll have to get together over there in D.C. and play chopsticks together. No, we can't play chopsticks, though. That's the thing. There's a rule oh. against it. Very good. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm you know, that. I have a huge respect for people that have fought hard to change culture in society, negative culture in society. And one of those people I followed since my, my teen years um, was uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson and his Rainbow Push Coalition. In October of 2019, though, they gave you an award, a media and technology policy inspiring leader. This is a group of people I've looked at from afar, but never got a chance to actually engage in. What was that like for you, that experience? I mean, it was it was great to get the call, uh, you know, to receive an award from Jesse Jackson, who's just been such a powerful figure uh, in our history and who was on the balcony with Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, you know, to be included in those circles is is uh, um, quite uh, an honor. It's it's uh, it's hard to explain. Almost, you know, similar to being accepted at LaGuardia, for example, you know, it was kind of a transcendent type of thing to get that call. Uh, but, you know, one of the areas that's uh, not given as much attention uh, as it should be given uh, or in the past wasn't given as much attention, now it's improving a bit, uh, is broadband access, broadband adoption, and making the Internet uh, more accessible and more uh, participatory, not just for folks who want to consume content, but folks who want to create it. And that goes back to what I was saying before about, you know, who has access to tools and who doesn't. You know, not everyone can afford a Libsyn subscription web host subscription or SEO platforms and this, that, and all mm -hmm. of these tools that we use in our, in our businesses every single day. Uh, and so, you know, that's a conversation that um, needs to start happening. And I know that that's something that Jesse has advocated for. So it's nice to see someone who's part of the old guard, uh, who's definitely keeping an open mind as far as, you know, what's the next thing that we're going to have to work on, you know, once we get everybody online, which believe it or not, still hasn't happened. I, New York City is rolling out a big effort to get folks in the projects online. For example, there's some insane number of people who live in housing projects in New York who don't have uh, access to broadband. And so these are all folks that we need participating uh, with their own platform and contributing to, you know, just such a rich uh, diversity of voices that we have in this country that's, you know, uh, shaped by you know, demographics, by income, by class, by um, political affiliation, uh, such a diverse uh, range of voices that we're not hearing from uh, within these communities that hopefully once we have access, uh, we'll be in a position to give them access to the tools that you and I have as well. So, When you, you look at where we are in the set of setting of, of the internet culture, um, trying to push away from policy, a lot of pressure being put on to get into internet three or blockchain based internet. Um, and the policies are right now just being written for Internet 2 or basically our ones and zeros based Internet. What are your thoughts? How soon is that blockchain Internet going to be coming something we're going to have to deal with? Because they say it's to free up the Internet. To me, it makes the Internet even less accessible for the poor um, at that point. But what what's your thoughts on that? You know, it's hard to say because, I mean, it's very new, but it's here already. It's already here. I mean, 90, yeah. I saw someplace that 90% that, uh, of Bitcoin is, is already mined by 24% of uh, its investors. Uh, so, so it's already here. Uh, there was an article in the information a few weeks ago talking about um, um, the metaverse and what it's going to entail and kind of envisioning this future where, um, you know, the currencies of, of nation states like the United States become less and less uh, relevant. You have all of these different micro communities with their own ideologies and their own, you know, cryptocurrencies and their own economies. How do you regulate that? I have no idea. All I know is that as a platform, uh, we need to be in a position where uh, we are adapting to that and reaching people in those communities so they know what's happening and, and they know 
um, how their own family economies are being affected by this switch over or this hybrid model where we have, you know, nation state currency. And then on top of that, you know, these little micro currencies and all of these different metaverses, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a risk that folks will become even more and more polarized because they'll be able to find a home online, uh, not only where they can have their voices heard, but also where they can make a living. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, right now we talk about that concept um, as a quote unquote niche concept, but I see that concept kind of evolving into what we're going to have um, when we have the metaverse. You know, anyone who's building a community uh, today, you know, four or five years from now, be well positioned to take that community and and and, and move it onto the metaverse, uh, you know, in platforms like Discord. Um, How many years behind like policy-wise? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted. I, I policy-wise, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. So I'm going to stay out. I'm going to stay out of that mm -hmm. uh, one. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like anything else, we can't get healthcare. So. Yeah. Um, I, um, I, don't know. I I say it, I even write a little bit in the, my book where um, my roots are, I was born in Thompson, North, North New Zealand, and um, I need to get a new cap and put on a tooth that, um, an old uh, wisdom tooth surgery from many, many years ago. And I went in and the person who said, oh, that's going to cost you $1,400 just to replace that cap. And I said, how much of it's going to be covered by my insurance? Because we have pretty good health insurance. And um, they said, oh, only 20% uh, of it. And I go, wow, do you know it's cheaper for me to fly home to New Zealand on a return flight right now in the middle of COVID, get that replaced and fly back here than it is to just get it done by my dentist down the street? It's sad. You yeah. Know? And the whole time you can be on your flight working. <laughs> <laughs> I can do podcasts in the middle of a 747 on the internet. Absolutely. Um, your podcast. Um, you tackle two major subjects like technology and Washington policy, which honestly in their own right can be a very dry conversation. And you turn into 40 minutes of juicy conversation. How do you do that? What is the well, my guests? I have great guests on, you know, uh -huh. I couldn't do it without them. The research that they're publishing, publishing, you know, these people are influencers. Um, a lot of them are folks who, you know, the institutions that I mentioned uh, before would never have been uh, noticed by uh, the ivory tower, uh, but many of them have penetrated it and are, are, you know, leading the charge and you know giving giving folks who wouldn't have um, paid attention to them before definitely a run for their money and some uh, competition as we've involved evolved into this world post George Floyd and you know during this COVID era where equity uh, is extremely extremely important and you know showing up everywhere. Uh, in every debate, uh, irrespective of how your ideological affiliation uh, plays into that, you know, eventually we're going to start talking about uh, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomics and gender uh, mm -hmm. and uh, LGBTQ plus. Uh, so um, the, my guests have been working on those issues for 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 you know forever. I mean, we've had Danielle Citrone on the show, who's a privacy expert and MacArthur Fellow now. Uh, she came on the show before she um, before she earned that, so I like to take credit for that a little bit, you know. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> she's a, a professor at the University of Virginia, really um, uh, just a well respected and and very um, a generous and inclusive person, uh, one of the most uh, inclusive um, and forward thinking folks in this space. We've had Sophia Noble on the show, who wrote Algorithms of Oppression many years ago, that was widely read. We've had Alondra Nelson, she's a uh, the Dean at Columbia School of Social Work, mm -hmm. who's now with the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House uh, prior to, to that role. So my, you know, the, the, um, the, the secret sauce is really our guests, plus the production. I mean, I brought a lot of that, you know, come, some of that uh, New York radio sound to it with our transitions and with our- I love um, your intro. I listened to several of your podcasts this last week. You guys have a great intro. Um, in fact, I, I forwarded it over to- um, uh, Trevor, who runs a lot of the audio engineering for us, I'm like, Trevor, uh, this is good. He's like, oh, we can do that. I'm like, good. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it really it's, is. It really is. And, uh, you know, that's that's the kind of stuff I like thinking about. I like thinking about sound and putting those things together. I guess it comes from the music background. So that's something I've always loved. Uh, why I'm actually doing uh, 
learning about electronic music now um, as mm -hmm. a hobby. So you know, I'd like to you know, learn more at my old age about how to do produce electronic music because I've been listening to it all my life. So you know, maybe it's time to kind of figure out how that works. Yep. I um I last week I had an interview with um Alvin um, Irby, who is the director and founder of uh, Barbershop Books, uh, which is a phenomenal nonprofit. They're in 16 states now, I think. What they do is they take um, um, the one of the most vulnerable reading groups. He was a kindergarten teacher, and he noticed that young black men did not have an acumen for reading. And so he took what was culturally the gathering point. Dads would come with their young five, six, seven-year-old boys who would sit in the barbershop while dad was getting their hair done. And he started turning every barbershop he could into a library and finding books that were relatable to these young men because he said he found out going back 10 years ago, if a young black man was going to learn how to read, all the, all the fun books to read did not have a child in that that reflected who them and their families were. So he started writing and getting his friends and other volunteers to write books that portrayed young black children having fun and then using these as an acumen to get them to want to read at an early age. And it's, it's a phenomenal nonprofit. I'm really proud of what he does and get to be able to call him a friend. But um, one of the things I asked him, and I'm going to ask you, because of the nature of his nonprofit and where his mission is to be able to bring um, a direct change to a particular grouping, and a voice to a particular grouping, how does he keep his mission focused with all the political noise and all the white noise that especially the last few years has been throwing at nonprofits, especially ones trying to address issues with um, minority grouping? How do you do I, that with your nonprofit? Because you've done a very good job of it. Um, when we think of your nonprofit, we think of what it does. We don't think of the noise surrounding it. And how do you keep that separation? Uh, you know, I grew, I, I, um, I just tune it out, uh, David. I mean, um, you have to read the news, obviously, um, and stay up to date. So I don't rule it out exclusively. But, you know, when I scroll down, I saw a statistic today that over 50% of Americans are, don't read above a, a, a sixth grade level. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that's what I gravitate towards newspapers more than TV. I can't remember, frankly, the last time I've watched CNN, MSNBC, or definitely not Fox News. I, I, or, you know, maybe sometimes. I don't like their production qualities. You know, the transitions and the way they, the way they do it. Um, it's not a, a political thing, or maybe it is, but you know, it's not my place to say. This is my personal opinion, not the organization. Uh, so I'm trying to make sure it's not an opinion at all and just total nonsense. But um, I mean, you, you know, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, we're dealing with people, you know, we're dealing with people and people are in pain, mm -hmm. whether they're liberals or, um, or um, conservatives, people are in pain and they're expressing their pain in the only way they know how. These people who ran into the, into the Capitol on January 6th, no one's sitting around feeling sorry for them. Are they entitled to redemption? Yes, like anybody else. Um, you know, but they can't, they're not going to get that redemption if they continue to hold on to this thing where it's totally fine to run into any building and threaten other human beings in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not how um, a loving society works. Some people don't really care about having a loving society, just like maybe they don't care about climate change. But I'm committed to m having genuine conversations with people uh, more than I was when I was younger. Uh, that aren't so ideological. Uh, I think that as a nonprofit where we have to be nonpartisan, it kind of puts us in a position to not just hear, quote unquote, both sides, because the idea of both sides is really just sort of fabricated, right? Mm -hmm. Because each individual is different. And what I've noticed, you know, living here in Virginia, where, you know, here is very diverse and Fairfax is very diverse, but if we go out a few miles into Loudoun County, that's when we hit the farms, that's where we hit the rural areas. And when I talk to people out there, um, you, they're not, you can't really put people into buckets. And mm -hmm. so I think by having those kinds of conversations, those kinds of heart-to-heart -heart conversations and trying to stay objective in these conversations, 
Um, I think that's really helped me kind of filter out, you, you know, the kind of news that's worth reading or uh, sometimes watching and the kinds of uh, headlines that I can already see in the description that, you know, maybe they're, they're not uh, as nonpartisan as, um, that they're not as nonpartisan as I would like to approach my, my life. That doesn't mean I'm not personally politically engaged, doesn't mean that I don't see injustice. Obviously, that's the goal of our organization is to address those things. Mm -hmm. But injustice happens in a lot of ways. I may not agree with J.D. Vance, for example, uh, but you know, I can't think of anyone else who's brought the struggles of those communities uh, in a way uh, that people can uh, relate to. And on the other side, Mr. Kendi, uh, who wrote um, the, the book on read his book and I'm trying to think of the name of his book and I'm gonna I find do that it all the time uh -huh. and and I'm and of all books I should know his book because now it's like really you're talking about all this stuff and you remember JD Vance's name but you don't remember uh, Mr. Dr. Kennedy's name so um and the reason is stage fright which mm -hmm. I've which <laughs> I've always had um sorry I, I have to look this up now this is they're not sure. gonna be able to edit this out either how to be an anti-racist, mm. okay? That, uh, that, that for the first time illuminated this idea that racism isn't what someone is, it's what someone does. Like someone can be racist, you or I can be racist one minute and the next minute we're inclusive. Yeah. Uh, and so I'd never thought of it that way. And just like with J.D. Vance, I'd never thought about what's happening in those communities from uh, his perspective. And so those are the kinds of things that I like, uh, that, I, that I try to tap into. Um, there are a lot of people with mental illness out there, right? So you have to be able to know what's mental illness uh, as well. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, deal with each person as opposed to putting them in, in buckets is really what I really try to do every single day. Yeah. I, um, I know in, in my family here, my father-in-law, strong Trump supporter has the All Lives Matter sign in front of his house, you know that. My wife has a, is a, you could say more democratic socialist worldview and loves her Black Lives Matter shirt. And whenever they're together, my father-in-law wears his Trump hat, she wears her Black Lives Matter hat. But they hug each other, they hear each other. They don't mind the political discourse because they're not angry at each other, but they totally disagree with each other, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if I was able to take that relationship and multiply it over my city, over my state, how much more healthy would we be? You know, you're welcome to your opinion, whether I agree with it or not, but can we be, have a friendly discussion about it and be able to communicate healthily on the subject so that I feel that you hear me, though you may not want to agree with me type of thing. And when I see my in-laws interaction, um, I'm like, gosh, I, I, to me, that's beautiful, right? Um, and, uh, and so I, I hope, I hope over 2022, 2023, though sometimes I feel very pessimistic about it, that that can be seen more and more nationally. But can I ask you for your organization, what are some of the big challenges that you guys are facing here in 2022? What are the things that you're well, really focusing on? I mean, like, uh, you mean policy-wise or Yeah, uh, wash, washing tech. What are some of the things that you guys are kind of drilling down on saying, this is really what we want to accomplish this year? Well, you touch base on it. I mean, misinformation is a big part of having those types of healthy conversations. And we have this, uh, this uh, narrative going on right now that we're kind of post-fact, that people don't know the difference between fact and fiction. Um, and that's causing people to be confused when they see facts. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of us learned what fact, difference between facts and fiction, uh, you know, we learned this in second grade. Uh, and, you know, the idea of what some people are saying online in some of these uh, communities, um, that those are facts is so foreign to millions of people that they, you know, you can't, there's no way to empathize with, 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 um, with folks who are just completely focused on information that's not factual. And I'm sitting here with you right now and because of the debate we're saying, I'm saying factual. And automatically, you know, we live in a climate where it's like, oh, well, how do you know what he's saying is factual, right? Um, 
So, you know, it's very hard to get to that point of misinformation, of misinformation, but that is, that's something we are, we're working on and, and looking at how to deal with misinformation in a country mm -hmm. that's so focused on, uh, on free speech. It's literally um, our first amendment. It's rule number one. Yeah. And so how do you regulate in that type of environment? How do you regulate in an environment where there's no hate speech um, regulation? Mm -hmm. uh, because we can't, we can't assume that that kind of regulation is coming anytime soon. We have Section 230, which gives Internet platforms uh, you know, broad uh, license to publish content uh, that may be uh, illegal, but they're shielded from liability for it. Um, <clears throat> but that's been conflated uh, into a debate around, you know, whether social media platforms should moderate their own content, where the longstanding principle was that commercial speech is, you know, is a form of speech and that, um, you know, these platforms, it's their First Amendment right to include whatever information they want on there. And just like uh, the uh, uh, cake shop uh, case, uh, the master, master, masterpiece cake shop refused to make cakes for uh, a gay couple. And Supreme Court that was held in them. Colorado, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, was it Colorado? I can't remember which yeah. day it was. But the Supreme Court held that, you know, that they were perfectly within their religious rights uh, to exclude that. And so the same the same uh, principle applies for social media companies. You're not going to go to a more conservative court and expect a different result right. uh, because, of, you know, unbeknownst to a lot of people, the liberals and conservatives on the Supreme Court, they both, uh, they're both committed to the concept of free uh, expression and free speech that's enshrined in the, in the Constitution. And so the Section 230 debate is a non-starter. It's a distraction. But uh, misinformation is a huge area for us uh, right now, and so we're looking at how, um, you know, how to deal with it uh, in a way that uh, uses some other framework other than logic um, uh, to kind of reinforce uh, our First Amendment free speech principles in a way uh, that people begin to understand again what speech means when it harms another person, whether it's a group of people, whether it's physical or whether it's emotional or mental uh, or excluding people from opportunities such as a cake, where people understand the difference between free speech and hurtful speech uh, yeah. is kind of where we're trying to get uh, so that we end up in a situation where you can have people on both sides of the aisle uh, come together and still, you know, have, uh, you know, good feelings for each other, warm feelings for each other, but can engage in a debate uh, in a way that that can remain healthy. Does the mission of Washing Tech have to do with them, and how would you answer them? What does it have to do with them, leaders who are listening? I think yeah. we told them just now. Yeah. Just um, helping um, devise that conversation. I mean, there are a lot of ways that organizations can participate that maybe outside, maybe outside their mission, but maybe tangential to their mission. For example, I was just thinking about, you know, what we can do to help the uh, individual you mentioned who has the barbershop bookshop or, you know, you know, why shouldn't we do a food pantry? Uh, yeah. You know, we, that's, a, that's a place where we can meet folks and, you know, provide food and educate them on tech policy. Mm -hmm. So there are, if you're struggling for programming, for example, and you're struggling to inform people, uh, tech policy can be something that brings people uh, to the table uh, to talk about in the context of whatever you're working on. So I don't know off the top of my head what the tech policies, but privacy obviously is a, what is what are the privacy policies and how does that affect uh, if they're using Wi-Fi in a homeless shelter? You know, how, what, you know what are the, the typical privacy issues that happen in private sh uh, shelters? You know, where are uh, homeless folks getting their news if they don't have access to newspapers? Um, you know, these are, you know, how do we, amplify their voices? Is there a way to amplify um, the voices of homeless people? I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Humans of New York. Uh, it was an Instagram page. Now it's a book uh, just talking to everyday people every single day. We've got to talk to everyone if we're going to have people engaged in this debate. And that's what Washington Tech is committed to do, is bringing those voices uh, to policymakers, whether they're local or state or, or, or national or international, uh, you know, so they're informed by folks who are, you know, they have their own echo chambers.
so that they're informed by folks who are outside of that and actually represent the voices of uh, not only their constituents, but also their residents. Uh, who, although they're homeless, they still vote. Uh, so those are important, per, important voices they need to hear from. Very good. You know, if somebody wants to listen to your podcast, and by the way, I encourage any nonprofit leader, anybody who's listening to this podcast, um, you're thinking about doing a podcast for your nonprofit, for your organization. Um, I want you to go listen to Washington Tech. I want you to listen to the intro. I want you to listen to the way they, they put together their, their content because it's a great lesson on how we can do that ourselves. Uh, so if somebody wanted to listen to you, Joe, what's the best way for them to contact and get connected with you and your organization? So you can find our podcast everywhere. And it's easy because it's just called Tech Policy. So you can just go in any platform and do T-E-C-H mm -hmm. policy and it'll come up. Uh, and then you can also find us on techpolicypodcast.org where you can set, uh, sign up for our mailing list uh, and get news about community, the community that we're developing. Uh, you can get access to, to episodes in your inbox if that's a preferred way to get uh, information. Uh, we have a newsletter uh, that releases tech policy news and is a place where I engage with folks. Uh, so you can go to techpolicypodcast.org and, and subscribe to our newsletter there and we'll get you set up with, with some other resources including the webinar that I mentioned earlier on children's online privacy, where they can learn about some of the trends that we've been seeing uh, that they may not be aware of, especially with things related to sex trafficking, what happens when their kids are online and who they're talking to, and what the policies are that affect That's that. a we big go deal. All of that in our webinar, uh, and we provide resources at the end so that anything I mention in the webinar, they can click through and read for themselves so they can draw their own conclusions. So, uh, that's something we'll provide access to once they join our uh, community. But the first step is to join our mailing list and participate, and they can do that again at techpolicypodcast.org. Excellent. If you go on to Audible, and I know a lot of you uh, listen and podcast on Audible, you can, if you type in Washington Tech on there, you'll see the entire podcast, as well as quite um, a litany of a library of uh, previous podcasts available for you to listen to. Um, I went and spun through a number of those and enjoyed them as well. But at the end of each show, Joe, we do a shout out to a nonprofit we think that is doing a great job. I'll go ahead and go first. And uh, while you're thinking of someone off the top of your head that you really think is doing a great job out there, but I want to just bring everybody's attention to Voices for Children. And Voices for Children uh, provide volunteer advocates to children in foster care. Um, I have a heart for children in foster care, um, being personally involved in that um, for 30 years in our family. And uh, there's some amazing children just looking for somebody or a group or an individual just to give them a hand, uh, an encouragement within that system. Um, greatnonprofits.org considered Voices for Children one of the top 10 best nonprofit organizations in, Washington, in San Diego, California. And uh, I would want to encourage um, you as a listener to go to speakupnow.org and just learn about what they're doing. Give them an encouragement, send them a note saying, hey, I love what you're doing on your website, what your mission is. And if you want to drop a donation, go ahead and do that. I know they'll love that as well. So, Joe, it's your turn. What do you want to give a shout out to? I mean, one of the most important things we have to deal with during COVID is you know, how to deal with after school programming. Uh, on the internet, well, you know, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to enrich, enrich kids so they're not just online choosing content uh, from on their own that we may not even be aware of? So I'm going to go ahead and give a plug to a Boys and Girls Club. They've been around for a long time. They have uh, many different chapters, and it says here that it's a national organization of local chapters, which chapters which provide voluntary after-school programs uh, for young people, uh, and you can find them online at bgca.org, bgca.org, Boys and Girls Club of America. Of America. Uh, it's a fantastic organization. I encourage everyone to check them out. I love the Boys and Girls Club. I agree. That's a great organization. Joe, it has been fantastic having you with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye now. I'm feeling better. There's no doubt about it.